Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Cannabis TV. Uh, I'm here with uh, Allison Brown, who's a sustainability consultant. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me. This show is brought to you by BudsFeed, LinkedIn for Leaders Live, and Eight Saints brand organic hemp CBD products. So tell us, Allison, where you are today and um, what got you into this industry? Yeah, so I uh, live in San Francisco, so a very um, hopping cannabis market here in California. Um, I actually got into the cannabis industry working with a company called Ease, which is a home delivery um, platform for cannabis. And my background prior to working for Ease was in renewable energy, uh, primarily solar renewable energy policy uh, across the country. And so I kind of just married the two and got into sustainability in cannabis and now have made it into my primary practice as a consultant. Was that uh, Ease down in, uh, was it Venice Beach? Is that where the office is? Yes, they do have an office in Venice Beach, but they also have offices in here in San Francisco, which is uh, the hometown of Ease. That's where Ease started. Um, and I think they have a few other offices now. It's It's been a while since I've been oh, there. Cool. So. Yeah, I was, I, I was down there. We, I went to a conference last year and, and met with uh, Thomas out there. So it's a pretty cool office right, right yeah. there in the heart of it. Yeah. Venice Beach. So, well, good. Well, tell us about Cultivate Energy. I know you do some consulting for them as well. What are you working on there? So Cultivate is uh, Cultivate Energy Optimization is an amazing firm that does energy efficiency auditing and renewable energy services for the cannabis cultivation industry. So primarily controlled energy, uh, controlled environment, agriculture in the cannabis industry, and they partner with utilities um, to provide these energy auditing services to cannabis cultivators, um, primarily in Colorado. And um, I just provide some facilitation and consulting to them. Sounds good. Good space to be in. Yeah. Well, let's talk about energy consumption. I know that's that's a big uh, a big thing in the cannabis industry. So, you know, as we were talking earlier, we talked a little bit about kind of the legality of why it is, and then also really around efficiency and and optimization. So, if you could go into those two, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. So um, cannabis obviously has a has a very um, interesting historical background, both here in the United States and around the world. And because of the kind of tricky legal status that cannabis has had, um, a lot of cultivators were kind of forced indoors to grow their product, um, you know, for the market before it became legal. Um, just in order to hide cultivation. Um, but as the industry continued to grow and become more competitive, pr both prior to legalization and uh, after legalization, cultivators continued to have a um, preference to grow indoors because it provides an enormous amount of control over the product and enables them to produce um, a very high yield. So they're able to produce four or five um, crop or yields per per year, which is much greater than they would be able to do um, in a completely outdoor environment. So the result of that is you have to provide everything that the plant requires through every stage of the cultivation process. So everything from lighting, you know, water, dehumidification, ventilation, um, and all of the other equipment that goes into um, providing creating a cultivation um, environment. So the energy intensity of cannabis is incredibly high. Um, one study found that one plant could per, could demand as much energy as seven refrigerators. So that's a really easy way for residents wow. like homeowners to think, you know, how much energy intensity a refrigerator requires. So just imagine seven refrigerators and all you're getting for that is one cannabis plant. So it's enormous amount of energy intensity um, for the industry. And of course that has effects on um, energy demand in every state. Um, and I think there was a figure at one point that said that the energy demands of cannabis in the country was about 1% of overall electricity output in the country, which is huge that any one thing could be as much as one whole percent of the electricity output in the country. So what, what is that, uh, the, uh, I guess the uh, energy go into 
pretty much. Is it HVAC? Is it more lighting? Uh, you know, so, really, is it humidity control? What is it really? So energy comprises about 50% of overall cost of a cultivation facility. And of that, about 30% is lighting and another 30% is HVAC. Um, and then, you know, it goes on from there, but lighting and, and HVAC are the, the two primary um, poles for energy. You know, when you were talking about the legality, so you'd mentioned something earlier when we were talking about interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you go into that a little bit about, you know, how that's inhibited the industry and why there was this need to grow, grow uh, go indoors and grow indoors before? Was it because of, you know, secrecy or, you know, can you explain some about that? Yeah, of course. So because cannabis is a Schedule One drug here in the United States, um, states are not allowed to transport cannabis interstate so between state to state so for example you know a cultivator in california couldn't sell to a distributor in the state of oregon so everything has to move within the state so the result of that is you have to meet all of the state's demand within that state so if a state um, that has really intense winters or um, you know a lot of rain anything that could impact growing a, a agricultural product outdoors, um, you have to grow indoors to be able to control and prevent those things from impacting your cultivation. So in a state like Colorado, which has obviously had a, a very, um, you know, one of the longer uh, legal cannabis markets, Colorado has a hefty winter. And so growing cannabis outdoors in the wintertime is not exactly feasible. So okay. um, in order to meet the state's demand, a lot of cultivators, the majority of cultivators grow indoors in order to make sure that they can meet demand year round. Um, and and that happens in every state in the country. Um, the, the interesting other side of it is that you have a lot of states like Oregon and California, for example, that produce way more than what's transacted in the legal market. So I think it's somewhere between three, three to five times what the actual like legal market transactions are. Mm -hmm. So we know that that cannabis is going somewhere. So it's either moving within the state in, in a black market uh, capacity. Um, it's moving interstate illegally, which is also black market to perhaps states that don't have legal cannabis um, or it's moving internationally. So that's kind of another element is that because cannabis has this like unequal footing globally, um, you have states that are producing it and it's moving not only interstate, but internationally in order to meet demand that other countries have for the product. So how, how would we know that, you know, for example, so we have seed to sale tracking. So you're saying that, you know, I mean, I guess how would, how would uh, regulatory bodies know those statistics? if we have seed to sale tracking? So I think the studies are based on the the output that these facilities, that these growers are growing. And then there's um, assumptions for um, how much cultivation is happening kind of illicitly based, just based on um, sales trends in the market. And uh, there was a, a study looking at the medicinal sales in California before legalization happened in 2018, before recreational um, adult use legalization happened in 2018, and how transactions looked after that period of time. And so they were able to kind of gauge and say, we know this much cannabis is moving in the state or out of the state, um, and only so much is moving within the legal market because they were able to track how much was moving in the legal market because of seed to sell tracking and, and um, other tra tracking um, programs. So a lot of it obviously is, is based on as assumption and just market trends and looking at um, markets pre and post legalization. Hmm. So when we do have, let's say there, there were not, they're not interstate commerce rules or there are PACs that are formed. Do you see that still as prevalent? Say it'll shift to another place like somewhere overseas where you can't, or, you know, or, or uh, in North America, South America, where you can't buy weed legally, do you think it'll it'll just continue to go? 
like that? I think, yeah, I think that you will always have some form of black market of any good that doesn't have common legal status globally. Um, I think the only really international trade that happens in cannabis is for medicinal and research purposes. So there is some cannabis that moves internationally. Um, I think like Germany grows a lot of cannabis that they use that's used in research in the, with, within the EU. Um, and obviously it's moving so that different countries can conduct that research. Um, but I think that will always exist as, as long as there are places where people can't get cannabis legally, they're gonna find ways to get it, even if it has to be done illegally because people need it for medicine and other uh, medicinal applications. Right, good, okay. So what do you think in terms of indoor versus outdoor? Where are the trends going? Because obviously you can still grow outdoor in some places, but do you think because of the controlled environment, people are uh, starting to just do indoor overall across the country? I think the between indoor, completely indoor and um, greenhouse, it's somewhere in like 80% range of um, how much is grown in, in those types of facilities. So that's only about 20% that's grown in pure outdoor um, cultivation centers. I think the indoor trend will continue, especially with um, Unfortunately, with with global warming, with climate change continuing to um, cause droughts and severe weather events, and you know very dramatic winters and uh, floods and all sorts of other um, dramatic weather events, just as with any agriculture, these cultivators they want to be able to control their output and they don't want to be susceptible to these weather events. Um, you know, drought or a freeze or a crazy flood or fires could wipe out cultivation facilities that are outdoors. Um, so at least having them indoors, they can, you know, grow relatively close to city centers and they don't need to have these huge swaths of land um, and they're able to have a little more insulation from, from climate change. So I think that's going to continue to be the trend for the industry. So that's why it's all the more important that we address the energy intensity of the industry and make sure that it's held to the same energy efficiency and renewable energy goals that a state has for uh, its own um, utilities and, and energy production. What about hemp, hemp industry in general? I'm not as familiar with hemp. Um, I think that just given um, kind of the overall trends in the industry, there's a lot of, um, applicability of what's happening in the cannabis industry, you know, in, in terms of meeting supply and demand and wanting to be able to control the environment, um, that there is going to continue to be a, a propensity to grow indoors. Um, I don't know the exact figures for how much hemp is grown indoors versus outdoors, but I would say just generally when it comes to products like cannabis, like hemp, um, the controlled uh, environment agriculture is kind of the safer way to go. It totally, it totally makes sense given what we've seen happen to, you know, farmers over the past 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah. well, let's, uh, let's get into uh, um, some ideas that you have about the industry moving forward in terms the cannabis industry moving forward in terms of energy use and energy consumption. Yeah. So one important caveat to mention just before we dive into like what states can do specifically is to remember that a lot of these, all of these facilities are not eligible for any type of federal incentive, whether that's a, you know, a, a business loan, um, incentives to upgrade their equipment, to install renewable energy. Those options are not available to cannabis businesses. So it's really critical that states take that into consideration when they're creating policies and programs that are designed to tackle this problem and, and make sure that that's kind of at the for forefront that states need to fill that gap. They need to meet that uh, difference that cannabis mm -hmm. facilities are not able to get from the federal government, whether it's on you know the business side of taxes or on the energy side specifically. So uh, the investment tax credit, which is a tax credit that 
most businesses can get if they install renewable energy on their facilities, cannabis businesses aren't eligible for that mm. because cannabis is an illicit uh, schedule one drug. So states, if they want to provide those types of incentives, they need to make sure that it's substantial enough to actually provide a significant and you know reasonable return on investment for uh, the investment in renewable energy because it is extremely up, you know costly upfront to do, and um, without a substantial enough um, incentive from the state, then cannabis businesses are just not going to do it. So that's just an important kind of thing to keep in mind as states tackle this issue. Um, I do think that incentives are a good short-term solution. There, uh, you know, I I like to consider incentives as kind of like a jump starter to encouraging certain adoption of energy efficiency, renewable energy. They're not uh, great long-term solutions because obviously they're very costly, um, very expensive. So um, going back to you know making sure that states are meeting this gap, it's, it's much more important that states are ensuring that businesses, cannabis businesses can acquire the loans that they need to get their business off the ground so that even if they aren't eligible for incentives or uh, the incentive programs uh, run out, that there are other ways that they can finance these incredible um, and energy efficiency, um, energy saving uh, investments. Hmm. So that's, um, I think those are kind of like the, the key ways to get, uh, to get things off the ground um, in terms of, of tackling this issue. I think more broadly, having overall renewable energy requirements for the industry is, is really key as well as energy efficiency standards. So we impose energy efficiency standards on all types of other industries um, and, and require certain types of buildings to have to meet certain energy efficiency requirements and comply with regulatory laws um, for those energy efficiency standards. And it's my position that there should be similar energy efficiency requirements in the industry assuming that the appropriate support mechanisms are in place as well. And so why aren't they now? Is it still just the federal illegality of it or it's just not a mature enough industry? And what I think, are, what's holding it back? Yeah, I think it's it's probably a lot of different things and, and different states have tackled it differently. Colorado, for example, has there, you have some counties in Colorado that have tried to tackle this at you know the county, the city, like very local level, and and create programs that um, support their their cannabis businesses. And other states have tackled it more from the utility side, so more of a, a regional approach where the utilities are actually in charge of creating and implementing these programs that service um, this targeted industry specifically. So providing support for energy efficiency auditing, helping them source helping the businesses source um, energy efficiency upgrades for their equipment um, and also providing quotes for how much it would cost for them to install renewable energy on site. Um, so every state has has tackled it a little bit differently. And I don't think there's necessarily of, of the examples that are out there. Um, I, yeah, I applaud every effort to tackle this incredibly challenging issue. I do think it's really critical for whatever is done to be done on a statewide basis so that there's equal application and equal access to cannabis businesses across the state. Um, and as we potentially look at national legalization, um, you know, we, we want to have as much consistency within a state so that when we come to legalization, it's perhaps a little bit easier to um, make cannabis businesses uh, kind of equal opportunity ac across states as well. Do you know of any states that, that you could point to that are doing a really good job right now with it? I think so. California is a, an interesting example because California actually used to impose a renewable energy requirement on facilities prior to um, adult use going legal in 2018. So under McCursa, which is the medicinal use law, there was a requirement that cannabis facilities meet the renewable energy requirements that match the state's goals. So obviously, California has really progressive renewable energy goals. So that was a very progressive thing for California to do. When 
adult use legalization happened, that requirement was kind of weakened. Um, and the intention was that it, it wouldn't impose such a burden on cannabis businesses. So going back to this, it's really hard to get a cannabis business off the ground. It's really expensive to do it in a super energy, um, energy efficient and, you know, renewable energy forward way. So they didn't want to impose that additional burden because they wanted to kind of help the industry jumpstart. Mm. So from, from my perspective, what they should have done is, you know, tackle some of those challenges um, that are involved in getting a, a cannabis business going and really put in place those um, small business support mechanisms and, um, these incentives directly for cannabis businesses uh, in place. And I think that can that California is trying to address some of those problems with things like a green bank um, that cannabis businesses can get support from. And it's just kind of a slow process. Um, there are some Boulder County in Colorado has a really great program where they they do require that cannabis businesses meet a renewable energy requirement of 100%. And if they don't meet that requirement, they have to pay essentially a penalty per kilowatt hour on their usage. Um, so it's in the proceeds from that go to like helping um, create more energy uh, sustainability in, in the industry. So that's a really successful program. But again, it's just one county in a big state that has a very large cannabis industry. Um, so I think it's really critical that programs like the one in Boulder County are, you know, brought up to the state level um, and, and applied on a much broader uh, swath of businesses. You know, a lot of, um, you know, we look to Europe for a lot of sustainability issues, you know, ahead of us in many, many respects. Um, how are some, say, countries or cities or areas in Europe doing regarding energy consumption in the burgeoning cannabis areas there in Europe? So I think Europe kind of approaches their energy use um, and and electricity infrastructure differently than we do. Um, they're a lot more firm on saying like everyone's got to play by the same rules when it comes to energy intensity and energy efficiency, renewable energy. Um, so in Germany, for example, uh, the renewable energy requirements are imposed on every aspect of um, the German economy. So that would include things like cannabis. Again, cannabis is grown in Germany primarily for uh, research purposes, as far as I understand. Um, so I don't really know how much, how applicable that is because it's not grown to the scale that it is, for example, here in California. Um, so I think, you know, California has the largest cannabis cultivation market in the world right now. And the majority of commercial cannabis growth ha is happening here in the U.S. So I think it's really critical that Cal that California and other states, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, um, you know, all states that are growing commercial cannabis legally set a really good example for how it can also be done sustainably. Um, that's really critical for the, the future of the industry not, you know, kind of exploding um, out against what the climate goals of all of the countries are. Right. Right. Good. Well, it sounds like you're doing some good stuff and, you know, really good growing area within the niche <laughs> of, uh, I mean, a niche within the growing area of cannabis. Yeah. Um, how can people get a hold of you if they have any questions about what you're doing? Um, uh, just follow up on this, uh, like your website, best way to get a hold of you. Sure. So I, probably the best way is through LinkedIn. Um, my name is Allison Brown. So I'm at, my LinkedIn handle is just Allison Brown. It's A-L-L-Y-S-O-N-B-R-O-W-N-E. There's an E at the end. <laughs> Very <laughs> critical. Um, so I can be reached that way. Um, and my email is on my LinkedIn profile. Um, I don't have a website because I'm a millennial. So I just have my LinkedIn. And <laughs> um and yeah, that's that's a, a great way to get a hold of me and I'm happy to, to talk to anyone that is wanting to talk about energy and cannabis. <laughs> well, it's, it's important. So leading up here uh, with 2021, what uh, what are you excited about uh, working on this this coming you know, couple months through the next year? Yeah, 
You know, I especially with the the new administration coming in um, and their very progressive approaches towards climate change and addressing the climate crisis, I think, you know, I'm shifting my gears to m maybe work more broadly on energy policy um, rather than specifically in cannabis. I do think that the cannabis sustainability is an incredibly important aspect of um, sustainability and 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 addressing. Um, our energy use as a country, because we are energy hogs here in the US and uh, cannabis is no exception to that role. So I I think it's really critical as we have this conversation about sustainability more broadly and that cannabis be part of that conversation because the industry is only gonna continue to grow, especially if we deschedule it, potentially legalize it. Um, so I think it needs to be part of that conversation and hopefully I can help contribute to that. Um, I did help, um, write a, an amazing paper, white paper that came out uh, just earlier this year from uh, the National Cannabis Industry Association on environmental sustainability in the cannabis industry yeah. um, and providing best practices recommendations. And it covers all aspects of environmental sustainability. So if you haven't read it, please look it up and read it. It's a great paper, it covers land use and soil, energy, water use, all everything under the sun of sustainability and cannabis. Um, so our hope is that, you know, that can be a good reference point for the administration as they and and Congress as they look to um, potentially legalizing cannabis and making sure it's done in a sustainable way. Great. Well, I, I you know, I, I had an interview with Tahir just you know a couple of days ago and we were talking about that sustainability paper. So, yeah, a good read for anyone. So uh, glad you were part of that. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. Take care, and thanks, everyone, for listening.